Now, there's a better way to do this. Because the way I've shown you right now, hmm, okay, what did I show you right now? That's an interesting question. I created this file temp.txt, but I'm not really clear how I did it. It's been 30 seconds, I'm almost 50 years old, my memory is going. How can I find out what commands I actually ran? History. When you type history, the shell will show you all the commands you've run recently. And recently typically means 200, 500, or a couple of thousand. It's something that you can set, have a look at the online material to see how. The shell is remembering everything you type that you actually run. So it's got a 100% accurate record of how you got to where you are. Here, you can see that I ran head-a to fish.txt to create temp.txt, and then later I ran tail-4 on temp.txt. The shell acts as your lab notebook. It remembers things so that you don't have to have a book open and be writing them down one by one as you go along. Right? Remember, programmers are lazy. If there's something you need, a programmer has probably invented it, you just have to find it. This is the mechanism. What if I want to rerun one of these commands? Well, I can look at the transcript on my screen and say, oh good, in order to redo the tail, I have to type tail-4 of temp.txt. That's a lot of typing. How about I use the up arrow directly from the command line to go back and forth, up arrow and down arrow, through my previous commands. If I want to rerun a command exactly the same way I did a few moments ago, I just up arrow to get to it and hit enter. And that's guaranteed to be exactly what I just did. If I want to run a slight variation on the command, I can go up arrow, use the back arrow to move back, and change that to, for example, 3. So I don't type in the things that I don't want to change. I only retype the things that I want to change. It's faster, it's less strain, and it's more accurate. You'll make fewer mistakes. Once I've done that, and I take a look at history, I can now see the record of my computational experiment. Now I'm showing you this in the Unix shell, but other tools, Python and R and MATLAB, most interactive computing environments have a history mechanism so that you can get a record of what you did. Okay, what if I want to keep that record? What if I've just produced a beautiful set of results that are going to turn into that one graph that every thesis needs. You know the graph I mean. You've got a curve and it's rising smoothly, but not too smoothly, towards an asymptote. It's just a little bit jiggly so people know it wasn't photoshopped, but it looks like it's pretty accurately following what your theory predicts. And there you go, there's your doctorate. Okay, you just need one good graph. But I've just spent three hours massaging my data to get that graph. If I want to take a record of what I did and save it so that I can redo it later if I need to, history, redirect to what I just did dot text. I could call the file anything. Please choose a more meaningful name than what I just did dot text. Redirection works with everything. Any command that would normally send output to the screen, you can redirect the output to go to a file. So now, sorry, I don't want to WC the history command, I want to WC what I just did dot text. I've got 97 lines in that file, and if I nano that file, you can see that I've got a record of all the commands I've typed in so far in this shell session. Now, I could edit this. I could delete the first 50 of those because they're not relevant to the result that I got. I could delete some of the LSs, or I could just save it the way it is. But if I save a file like this, every time I get a result that I want to keep, I've now got the equivalent of a lab notebook at almost no cost. I don't have to trust myself to write things down accurately. The shell, or Python or R or MATLAB or whatever tool you're using, is doing that for you. Now, to get rid of that file, I type rm, which is short for remove. So, ls, there it is, rm, and then ls, and it's gone. I'm going to rm temp.txt as well. Just leave myself with my original data file. Because we're now ready to come back to the cleaner, easier way to select lines out of the middle of a file.
as you recall, head dash eight, a fish dot text gets me the first eight lines. What I did last time was send that to a temporary file and then select the last four lines of that temporary file so that I've taken the bottom of the top to get the middle. But then I've got this temporary file and I've got to type multiple commands. What if instead I said head dash eight of fish dot text vertical bar, which is pronounced pipe, to tail dash four. What this means is, head, I don't want you to send your output to the screen. I don't want you to redirect it to a file. I want head to send its output to the next stage in my data processing pipeline. Vertical bar is called pipe because we use it to construct pipelines. The thing on the left is the source of my data. It's the head command and it would normally send its output to the screen. We can use greater than to redirect it to a file or we can use pipe to send that to another command. Now tail dash four normally expects a file name. We've been saying tail dash four of temp.txt. But in this case, I don't give it a file. It says, oh, right. You don't want me to read data from a file that's living on disk. You must want me to read data from some other source. Well, we've provided it with another source. Its data source is the output of the head command. So what we have here is a two-stage pipeline. Head is producing data, which gets sent to tail. Tail reads its data from the output of head. Now, I can obviously combine lots more commands. I could say head dash a to fish dot text, pipe to tail dash four, and pipe that to wc, and sure enough, it says there are four lines. Head read the file and did what it does, which is select the first eight lines. Pipe means send that and make it the input of the next stage. Well, the next stage is tail dash four. There's no file name, so it must be reading from a previous command stage. And then its output is piped to the WC command, which just counts how many lines there are. All right. This is where the power of the shell comes from. And it's where the power of other programming systems come from. Once you have a vocabulary of simple operations, you need ways to combine them. Just as you would say log of sine of x squared. Right? That means take whatever x is, square it, calculate the sine of that value, and then take the logarithm of that. Except we should probably say log of abs of sine of x squared because sine can go negative. Okay, let's pretend I got it right the first time. Log of abs of sine of x squared is just a data pipeline. We're feeding x into the squared function. Its output is fed into the abs function. It's into the sine function. Its output is fed into the abs function. Its output is fed into the log function. It's as if you were saying square x pipe to sine, pipe to abs, pipe to log. Now we can't actually do that because these aren't Unix commands. But you know how to do this in math. A good programming environment is one that allows you to easily compose functions or tools. The Unix command line lets you do it with standalone programs that pipe data back and forth. As we'll see a bit later, languages like Python let you do it by calling functions. And increasingly today, there's a third option, which is go and ask some service on the web to do something for you. You can, for example, go and ask Google from the command line to process some data and give you back some answers. And we'll see examples of that later on. You can take several web services that are being run by different labs around the world and have your data go to the first, which sends it to the second, which sends it to the third, which looks it up in some database and merges it with answers from somebody in Australia, or if you're in Australia, somebody in New Zealand, and merges it all back to you. So we've now got many different ways to compose useful bits of code. And knowing those techniques is the key to productive programming. Okay. So at this point, we're going to take a break for your first couple of exercises, and then we'll come back. Thank you.